Welcome to Money Talk, making good investing easy. This episode is about the next generation, how and where to invest for your children, grandchildren, nephews and nieces. And how to pass on wealth to the next generation. We'll look at how a junior ISA can help your child avoid student debt. Why emerging markets are a good investment for children and grandchildren. Passing on your pension and minding the cost of childcare. Today's youth face many challenges. A competitive jobs market, low wages, inequality, the burden of caring for an ageing population and getting a foot on the property ladder. The cost of university and rising student debt just add to the list. Micah explains how you can help the next generation face these challenges with a junior ISA. Established in the poorest working class districts of the rapidly expanding industrial towns of 19th century Britain, ragged schools offer children a free basic education. Before the ragged school movement, parents had to pay for their child to attend school. And very few could afford this luxury. Free education is a tradition that spans history. Unfortunately, for many planning to go to university today, there's a price to pay. Higher education costs have been rising, and today many young people will leave university saddled with debt. Thankfully, there is help available. A junior ISA is a very good way to save for your child's future. Say you invested just £42.50 a week from your child's birth into a junior ISA. That's about £184 a month. Assuming investment growth of 5% a year and taking into account fees, that would leave a savings spot of around £57,000 by the time your child turns 18. That's enough money for a debt-free degree or deposit on their first property. With a junior ISA, money is locked away until your child reaches age 18, which enforces a good savings discipline. Just remember that once they reach age 18, the junior ISA becomes their ISA and they assume full control. So make a point of talking to them about their savings and educating them about the value of money. After all, education starts at home. And when those children do leave home, many of them, of course, will go to university. And a junior ISA is a great way to save for a university education. The beauty of the junior ISA is once a parent or guardian has set it up, anyone can contribute. So grandparents, godparents, aunts, uncles. And once you've set it up, then I guess the focus is on what you actually put into the junior ISA. Yes, and a lot of parents might be reluctant to take too much risk with their child's investments, but the fact of the matter is, if you start investing for them when they're quite young, they've got a very long time horizon to ride out the ups and downs of the stock market. And it's that length of time, of course, which gives you the opportunity to grow your investments. That's right, but it also matters where you invest. So I'm going to go speak to Nick Price, an emerging market investor, about the merits of investing in these regions for the next generation. As investors, we need to keep up with a fast-changing world. Take emerging markets. It's easy to fall back on an out-of-date cliché. The developed world's money is still looking for opportunities in emerging markets, but it's two-way traffic now. Investment is about stories. Sometimes they're personal. This is my father-in-law. It's 1955, he's just arrived from India to work in Coventry. 30 years later, his son is an engineer at the city's most famous car maker, Jaguar. Fast forward to today, who owns this iconic brand? Well, it's Mumbai listed Tata Motors. For my family and for many others, the emerging market story has come full circle. I'm off to the city to catch up with Nick Price. He manages Fidelity's Emerging Markets Fund. In its most simplistic case, you've got about six of the world's seven billion population living, working in emerging markets. Yeah. From a GDP perspective, maybe about half of the world's GDP today is generated in, in emerging markets. 
So there's a real growth opportunity uh, in emerging markets. Uh, and that growth is driven, of course, by a far better demographic profile, a younger population. For example, in Mexico, uh, one would see people uh, taking more flights grow. That's growing about 12 to 15 percent a year. Yeah. So I guess one of the things which people tend to bring up when they talk about emerging markets is the question of risk. Do you think that investing in emerging markets is riskier than investing in developed markets? It, it is the factory of the rest of the world and so where demand moves dramatically they can be very significantly impacted. So I think from a short-term price volatility perspective I would say if you're investing in emerging markets you've got to be prepared for more price volatility. There are other risks, aren't there? There's po political risk yep. and um, I guess another thing that people often mention is corporate governance. Yeah, there are a huge number of events which are, are very difficult to predict uh, politically. I guess my, my, my bottom line from a political perspective is I think pragmatism generally wins the day. Mm. Um, there are lots of social issues not too different to Europe yep. where there are lots of social pressures between the haves and the haves not. Yep. But um, in general, I'm not overly concerned by the, the political risk that I see. Do you spend a lot of time in country talking to companies? How important is an active investment approach? Yeah, no, it's critically important. Um, you know, Fidelity is, is fortunate in that we've got some 48 analysts in emerging markets. We've got the offices in Mumbai, where I was just earlier this week, uh, in Shanghai, in all the local markets. So we, we have a great presence and we have a, we have a very strong analyst team and, and actually an analyst team that's a little bit more geared towards the consumer, which is where I, I tend to find most of the opportunities. As we drive into the future, emerging markets are going to be a big part of all of our investing stories. So emerging markets are a great way of investing for the next generation, but it's not just about that. It's also about passing on wealth through the generations. That's right, and I think many people don't realise that a pension is actually one of the most valuable things that you can pass on. Ed Monk went to Greenwich Market to explain how it works. One person's trash can be someone else's treasure. And the things we value most aren't always the things that cost lots of money. And when it comes to the things we inherit or that we pass on ourselves, the most cherished items aren't always the most obvious. And that can be the case with your finances too. Did you know that of all your financial assets, it's those held inside a pension that can potentially benefit your family and loved ones the most? Since 2015, money you hold in a defined contribution pension no longer faces the death tax if you die die before age 75 and this money can pass to beneficiaries of your choosing with no tax to pay, whether that's as a lump sum or as an income. Die after 75 and beneficiaries simply pay tax at their rate of income tax. I met with Carolyn Jones, Fidelity's Head of Pensions Product, to find out more. Broadly, pensions now will be more tax efficient if they're defined contribution than, say, property or other investments passing them on. So yes, you seriously need to think, if you're not going to spend all your money on yourself and you do want to pass some on, what you should spend first in retirement. We're talking here about defined contribution pensions. How does the situation with those compare to um, defined benefit schemes or even annuities that people might have bought for income? Defined benefits, it will largely depend on the scheme, but usually in a defined benefit scheme, when you die, they will give an income to a dependent. Um, so that might be someone you're married to or someone you're cohabiting with or children that are, are still in full-time education. And, and usually that's all you can do with, with your pension. Annuity, that will depend on the terms of the annuity you bought. You may have bought what's called a guarantee that the annuity would pay out a lump sum if it hadn't paid so much time. So typically that might be a 10 year or a five year guarantee. But again, it will be depend what you've bought at the time and that won't be changeable. What practical steps do people need to take to make sure that their planning is in order? Well, firstly, you need to understand what pensions you've got. So have you got defined benefit pensions? Have you got defined contribution 
pension. You may want to take advice on what you should spend first and how best to shape your retirement income. I think most importantly, you need to fill in your expression of wish. So that's something that your scheme administrator holds that details your wishes should you die. And that means you can articulate what you want to happen to your money. And, and you can articulate one person or several people. And that really helps administrators carry out your wishes. No one likes to think about what happens after they're gone, but most of us want to do whatever we can to look after friends and family when that happens. And making smart use of a pension from an inheritance point of view is a really good way to do that. It's important to save and invest for your children, but it can be difficult if you're battling with the high cost of childcare. So before we go, here's a quick explainer on how parents can mind the childcare gap. Girl or boy? That's usually the first response of soon-to-be parents, but nowadays it's more likely to be nursery or nanny. UK parents face some of the highest childcare costs in the world. Often childcare costs outweigh the monthly mortgage bill. So many parents give up work to look after their children. Companies lose valuable talent and parents lose out on earnings, benefits like a pension, and find it hard to re-enter the workforce. Even if you can afford childcare, there's no guarantee that you'll get it. And it's not just about costs and getting the best care for your child, it's also about the long-term impact on women, their careers and their savings. Here's how you can mind the childcare gap. 1. Make the most of childcare vouchers. 2. Remember that all 3 and 4 year olds in England are entitled to a certain amount of free childcare hours a year. Three. Be careful of the high income child benefit charge. If you earn above a certain amount and receive child benefit, it could cost you. Four, save into a pension. If you're not working or you've chosen to work for yourself, put some money into a self-invested personal pension. Finally, try to plan ahead by putting some money into a savings account like an ISA. Next time you think girl or boy, nursery or nanny, remember to also think pension or ISA. Hopefully this episode of Money Talk has left you with a lot of food for thought about investing for the next generation. Keep an eye on our Money Talk page and Fidelity's YouTube channel for the next episode. And you can find out more about retirement and investment from me and my team on all Fidelity's digital channels. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. Goodbye.